Welcome to the 10th episode of the 6th season of the Ubuntu Podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk to Ivanka Magic about Canonical's design team. We've also got another time-saving tip in Command Line Love, and we'll read your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in our IRC channel. I'm Tony, and joining me this evening are a motley crew in the shape of Mr. Alan Pope. Hello. Mr. Mark Johnson. Hello. And Miss Laura Cowan. Hiya! <laughs> I did say they were motley, didn't I? Oh, dearie me. Right, excellent. Well done for not breathing, everybody. <laughs> what What have we been doing? Alan, why don't you uh, tell us what you've been up to? Because it might be Ubuntu-related. Uh, it vaguely is, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, juju. I've been doing Juju. Right. Juju. Yes, I... Um, so Juju is this uh, rather super thing for allowing you to deploy... A DevOps in a shell script. Yes. Uh, <laughs> deploy services it's mainly designed for the cloud so you've got like a whole raft of servers in the cloud somewhere and you want to deploy lots of them with hadoop or wordpress or whatever you want to run on them and so you do do deploy command and then boom loads of machines spin up but you can also test it out on your local machine so if you're a developer you can you can simulate that kind of uh, workload on a, on a machine locally. So you deployed a cloud in a local machine. It uses um, Linux actually, containers. Yeah, it uses it? LXC, Linux containers. So um, it's sort of like, like a, little, a virtual machine. But they're all running on the same kernel. Yeah. It's really clever. It's really, really cool. But I wanted to do it not on my local laptop. I wanted to do it on my micro server at home so I could access all these things from other machines in the house because I wanted to like spin up, for example, um, a WordPress instance to have a play with or I wanted to spin up a an own cloud instance to have oh. a play with. Um, or a little Minecraft server or something, and you just go, juju, deploy, Minecraft, boom, you've got Minecraft server. And it works. Yeah. But there was a bug in it that, or there was a problem with it, that it would only expose it to the local machine because it's designed to be run on your your own laptop as a developer. Right. So the only machine that can connect mm. to it is your own laptop. Um, but I figured out how to fix it via mm-hmm. editing some config files somewhere. And, and did you uh, document that? Uh, I did, on Ask Ubuntu. Excellent. I asked a question and then and figured on. out the answer myself. <laughs> I did the answer. Did you um, pay yourself a reward? Mm-hmm. Uh, I did. I think I put a bounty on it, actually. Did you give yourself a thumbs up? Uh, I gave myself an up upvote, yes. <laughs> I did. Oh, Mark. That was fun. What Tony, about you? I contributed an article to opensource.com. Ooh, what's opensource.com? It's um, a sort of community news website magazine-y thing for open source articles which is sort of um curated by red hat oh right and so what, what, it was sort of the, the domain was donated to them a few years ago because it was owned by i don't know someone else and they thought oh what can we do with this mm. so they do this sort of magazine what was the article about uh it, about a project called coa which is an open source library management system um, which has quite an interesting history in terms of how it's sort of been managed and the rights to it have been owned and traded and so on. Um, when you say library management, as in books? As in books. As, right. Oh, it's, yes, not as in programming libraries, as in an actual physical library. Building full of books. Yes, right. how you manage one of those. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, so um, I wrote the article for work and offered it to omensource.com and they put it on there. Do you get paid? No. <laughs> well, I got paid for, you know, doing it as part of my job. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. So that's all right. You don't get gratuities or a hit of the advertising revenue then? No. Right. What about you, Laura? What have you been up to? I got a jelly baby from a Doctor Who fan in a queue for pizza. Tony, what have you been up to? <laughs> um, I've been experimented on. Good. Now let's listen to the interview. <laughs> Joining us on the line now is Ivanka Magic from Ubuntu and Canonical. Hello, Ivanka. Hello. How are you today? Well, I'm very well, thank you. And you? Um, not too bad. Have we dragged you away from anything important? Um, just dinner. Just dinner. Okay. <laughs> oh, dear. I can wait. Yeah. That's never a good way to start an interview, dragging somebody <laughs> away from dinner. So, you, we, l- we last talked to you on the show three years ago, believe it or not, um, starting with uh, talking about your design team work. Um, how has the last three years been? <laughs> <laughs> how, have we, how have I been for the last three yeah, years? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been very busy. Good. Um, and I have, I've also, don't forget, had a, had a year off travelling. So, um, oh, yes. So you, the you, last, so I, had, I had a sandwich year. Um, so the last three years have been very, very busy. I think we've done an awful lot, really, where, in the time. Where did you travel on your year off? 
I, we, my husband and I rode a motorcycle from Alaska to Argentina wow. for 10 months. Wow. One motorcycle each or the same motorcycle? One, one motorcycle. <laughs> I don't ride. Oh, I just right. sit on the back and wave. <laughs> <Hang on>. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That sounds like an experience and a half. So uh, had things changed when you came back to Canonical what, in, in terms of design? Um, no. <laughs> yes and no. I think that um, there was, I'd say not really. I think Canonical overall has grown a little larger um, or grew a little larger in the year that I was away. And I think that um, there was like with the 12, 1204 release, um, there, was a, there was a level of maturity reached, which is what I came back for in the last UDS in Oakland. So I think uh, 1204 was a nice, solid release, um, which was nice to see. I think some of the um, attitude to some of the bugs or some of the prioritization, I think design had more influence over them because I think we've, we've uh, earned our stripes a little bit more in the Ubuntu and Canonical communities than we had when we spoke three years ago. So I think we do have more influence. And so this, we have more ability to steer engineering resources and prioritization around bugs. Um, I, kn- I don't know if you'll recall things like the 100 Paper Cuts project and mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All, all of those projects, and which is still going on, but we have less involvement with it, or the it's more sort of community-led or community-run, as I understand it now, because I don't think we're... When a lot of these things we can set in motion, but we're very small, really. If you mm-hmm. think about I currently lead the platform design team, and there are 11 of us. Uh, responsible for designing Ubuntu across all form factors. So that's not many people. And, um, and over that time, uh, since, yeah. since since you've been back, things have changed in that um, we, things have opened up a lot more. Is, is that right? how, how, how has that happened and how has it been received? Um, I think it's, it's happened by virtue of the fact that we've had our phone and tablet launch. Uh, mm-hmm. We've had the big go to CES and get lots of press coverage and let people see it and let people experience it without having things leaked beforehand and people criticizing it before they've seen it. That's one of the things I do cover in the blog post that you, you, you uh, mentioned um, that you wanted to talk about when you invited me on the call. But one of the things I, I talked about there is that, you know, for, for business, you do need occasional, you need PR moments. And that's where balancing open, uh, development of design and the realities of commercial success um, sometimes come into conflict. So I think that was a major factor. We had an enormously successful CES, followed by a very, very successful MWC. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, MWC is Mobile World World Congress, which is in Barcelona. There's literally thousands of people at those sort of events showing off all kinds of devices and apps and interfaces. And... Uh, I believe that we were we were voted best in show by CNET. Cool. I think it was mm. CNET. Might be worth checking. But that's mm. amazing that Ubuntu actually got that kind of visibility and that kind of recognition. Um, because when we talk about Ubuntu, we don't talk about we talk about Ubuntu on a phone. So people, even when we're doing the demos, we're not talking about a phone product or a tablet product. We're talking about Ubuntu. So it's an opportunity to introduce people to the idea of the whole ecosystem. And get, um, which I think is amazing. Uh, and getting that sort of recognition from somebody like CNET is worth the uh, complication of developing something in less than fully open way. Well, I think I am not in a position to, to either have measured or to know that it was worthwhile. I can't, you know, I, I don't know. It's not my job to worry about how effective our PR and marketing are. Right. Um, but I do know that having that kind of Journalists want stories, so, mm. and it's not a story if everyone's already talked about it. Or right. so you can actually create more fuss if you've got if you're having a big reveal. Um, but as I said, it's not my core area of expertise, so I don't know if it's. But I think I don't know. What do you think? There's an awful lot of coverage. I I work in a design team and. A lot of what you talked about in your blog post was very relevant, even in a closed source world where we have to collaborate with the developers and it's getting that balance of 
owning your own sort of opinions and thoughts and designs and making sure everybody feels bought into the process of designing it and so yeah we could I could relate to a lot of what you were saying but at least we don't have that issue I guess of you know, of being able to launch something because it's all private and I guess the majority of your development team isn't private um yeah I think that's I think that's true I mean we have one of the things that's interesting that now that you mention it, when I, 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 I said in the blog post that I did it, I, I, it was a speech first, a talk I did at Mozilla. And one of the questions somebody asked me at the end of it, he, he sort of came over and went, yeah, nice, nice talk. Um, but really what you should be talking about is engineering and design working together because what you're talking about applies everywhere. Yes. Um, which I think it, it, is, it is quite an interesting point and one I think I should cover a bit more in my follow-up because one of the feedbacks I had from Stuart who I mentioned in my post was yeah but you don't tell me what to do (laughs) so I need to follow up on that with some with some instructions not just truths so um one of the you've talked about the the big reveal and the and the the PR ta-da at um, CES and MWC um, would I be right in saying there's there's not much left for us to do a tada about, and therefore everything from this point onwards or from that point onwards is now in the open. You've transitioned to openness. I uh, I can't promise that there'll never be anything that's kept for a tada, but right now we're operating in a fully public way. I mean, the codes released as daily uh, releases, specs are public, hangouts are public. You know, there's lots of not everything's happening in a public way. Um, I can tell you that today I have no instructions to keep anything back. <laughs> That's good. Sorry. I'll, I'll check I in again. I'll check in again with you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't hear that. I'll check in again with you tomorrow and next weekend. Yeah, yeah, check in then. Yeah, check in both. Is it fair to say that that's a relief? Is it is it different to be working this way now? I think that it is fair to say that it's a relief. Yeah. <laughs> Is that because it's um, it's easier just in general to do your job if you don't have to worry about um, l- about you know what you can tell to who, or is it is there more of a thing about you know that there's not going to be any sort of controversy in the community with you know people accusing Canonical of doing stuff themselves and not involving people. Um. I think it's a bit of both and a third thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the third thing is the most interesting one is that I joined Canonical to work on an open source operating system and to do design in the open. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's one of the the, the main differentiators, the most, uh, one of the most crucial things about the job. And yet we've had to, we've, had to not operate in that open way. So I think for me, that's also a relief, the fact that I can, I can talk about my work and fulfil what I, what I intended to do when I, when I joined. Cool. There's a kind of collective um, sigh of relief, I think, from, from a lot of people in Canonical when, um, in the past, when we knew we had to keep this stuff secret because of the big reveal. If you're talking to people at a public event and you're you're talking to other canonical people, there's this kind of over the shoulder look you have to do to make sure that there's no, you know, non canonical people nearby. <laughs> you know, if you're having a conversation about that, that you know, secret stuff, and, yeah, now, and that, now you don't have to worry about that. No, it's brilliant, and that's a, that's, a, that's a lovely feeling. So, as part of the open stuff, um, you've been working uh, with the core apps team that I've been working with on the engineering side um how how have the design team been involved in that um very actively i think it's fair to say um i think we're we're sort of basically trying out processes we wanted to try out for for years and that in that um all the the design team is very much doing the design work at the moment we started to have a couple of contributions around some of the visual uh, treatments of some of the apps I know I've seen something from somebody, uh, particularly for the weather app, but largely the, the design is still being done by us. And I think that's particularly important at the moment because we want to set a scene for the apps and what they should look like and how they should behave. Mm-hmm. Um, 
sort of set the direction, I think is the best way of putting it. But, but all that work is being uh, delivered publicly. It's being, uh, feedback is being sought and responded to. The guys working on, the, on that have weekly hangouts with uh, community members who are, who are building the apps. Um, they are, there is active dialogue. In my blog post, I mentioned that um, uh, sometimes, you know, we, we all, everybody can have a good idea. So it's good to remember, it's good to have those conversations nice and early because obviously somebody building something has a lot of insight into ways of making things faster, the way, ways of, cut, you know, uh, creating some kind of shortcuts in the UI or whatever it might be. And if you're not having open conversations about that and people don't feel they can comment, then you're actually missing out on very valuable input. So I think that's quite a, that's quite a good thing about that core apps work. Like, I don't know who it was that came back from a call and went, one of the developers had a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> who knew like, that we could do that? I, th- I think that was today, crazy. actually. That I was on that call. It was, the, it was the weather guys who came up with some idea for how to represent the transition from one day to another or to, from one weather type yeah, yeah. to another. And, and yeah, I was, I was kind of surprised thinking, oh, crikey, uh, that's a developer coming up with a design idea. Uh-oh, <laughs> this could go horribly wrong. But th- the, the design guys were really welcoming and saying, okay, give us, give us some mock-ups or give us some, uh, some wireframes or some kind of, um, a prototype to, to let us see and we'll work with it and it, it was re- it was really really nice to see that like bi-directional <laughs> um, input definitely I think that's so I think that has a lot of promise I think obviously being that it's the first foray really into doing something truly open from inception um, there's going to be improvements to be made to process and there'll be degrees of things being more open or diff- I don't know really what's going to happen next but so far from what I can tell a lot of very good progress is being made so I'm certainly not observing it or, or, or watching it evolve and thinking oh we're going to have to change stuff I'm just aware of the fact that one generally does um, especially as people get more used to one thing then you have to you know you have to improve on the situation the more developers we have who are knowledgeable of design processes and more um, this is the part where education, I think, is really important. More able to have conversations with designers and vice versa, mm. the less process we'll probably need. So, how does um, how does it work when uh, you're so, like someone from the community wants to contribute to your design team's work? Um, obviously, developers are going to be used to working with code repositories and bug trackers. Do you have the same sort of processes around design, or is it more about having just meetings and conversations and working out what you're going to do from that? I think at the moment it's a bit more about meetings and conversations. I know people are sending things to, I think it's the Ubuntu phone mailing list. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, so that's the current uh, post or the current way it's happening. Currently I'd really say the emphasis is on conversations Mm -hmm. because I don't think the, the community we have at the moment really knows what we're looking for and we don't know how to ask for it and <laughs> right. you know there's lots of things to to learn mm-hmm. um and the same happens uh, what laura was talking about earlier about the way you work with um, um engineering teams in general it's if you've got a good working relationship between engineers and designers then they there is a much better flow of ideas and much more appropriate ideas if you can communicate the vision um, of what you're trying to achieve to development team, then they will come up with a more appropriate ideas. If you haven't clearly communicated what you're trying to do, then of course there'll be ideas that are not going to they're not appropriate. Mm. Yes. So um, the more you work together, the better. Yeah. In my experience, that makes sense. Communication is key. It seems it really is. <laughs> so if people want to find out more about the work of the design team, where should they check first? Uh, design.canonical.com blog. Excellent. And all, all, all paths start from there, I'd say. <laughs> and will, you, will people be blogging a lot more about the work that you're doing? Yes, definitely. Um, um, the, uh, Christina, Kana, Mika, the people who are working mostly on the apps, they, they're blogging at least weekly at the moment. Cool. Um, so hopefully we'll get more and more stuff being talked about in the open like that. 
Well, I think it's fair to say that design is so much more central to the work of Ubuntu now than it was three years ago. Mm. Um, and people are very excited about just how pretty the Ubuntu phone is looking um, and yeah. that it you know, will be a lot more usable than perhaps some alternative phone operating systems that shall remain nameless. <gasps> so uh, a, a testament to you and your team's work. So thank you very much indeed for taking the time to come and talk to us this evening. Thanks, And uh, we will leave you to your dinner. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers right, then. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye bye. And now let's have some command line love. Yes. Well, this is a bit of a tricky one. We've been doing GUI loves recently, and this one is a command line love, but actually it has a web based front end to it. Ooh, so, controversial. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of a blend of the two. Is it gooey? Is it not? Oh, Who can say? Who can say? So it's um, it's something relatively new. It's called BitTorrent Sync. Mm-hmm. So you've probably heard of um, BitTorrent. It's the peer-to-peer protocol for transferring large files around mm. um, where the workload is distributed among lots of different people. But this is different. This is a new product from them, which uses some of the similar technologies. Um, and it's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. And they've got uh, lots of downloads on their website for 32-bit, 64-bit Linux. And it's just a single binary. Um, so and do. when you run it, uh, it allows you to synchronize files like Dropbox or like Ubuntu One File Sync or like Spider Oak mm-hmm. between machines. Yeah. But the data transfer is all encrypted, which mm-hmm. is good. It uses a system of keys so that only you can decrypt the the data and the people that you share the key with can decrypt the data. Right. So you can use it to share data between multiple machines that you own and you can also use it to share data with other people uh, who have machines that you don't own. So, for example, I could I could have a directory on my machine with um, loads of uh, uh, like MP3 files or OG files of my podcast, for example. Yes, right. And, Which are all uh, CC licensed, so <laughs> exactly. freely distributable. Freely distributable. And then I can give you um, a, a key yeah. which allows you to see those files, and then it will synchronize the files across to you from the folder on my machine to the folder on your machine, just like you know Dropbox or whatever. And if someone else adds it, then it would. Do it peer to peer from both of us. Exactly. To the, more, the more people who want it. So, so for that use case where you've got one person who's sort of got the source of some data and it's spreading to lots of people, it's really, really good because yeah. BitTorrent's really good at that. But it's also really good at just sharing files between your machines because it doesn't store your data on a remote third party server. Ah. So you, you own the data all the time. It's on all your machines. Yeah, so it's not going to Dropbox's server, then to your other computer. It's exactly. just going straight like, to your other like computer. Like Dropbox does, yeah. Yes. BitTorrent sync so you is don't just hit, between your machines. You don't hit quotas limits like you do on Ubuntu One nope. or Dropbox. Nope, no quota limit at all because it's all between your machines. Yeah. So as long as Unlimited. you've got the hard disk space. Yeah, and it's all secure and... Uh, and it's really very nice. It's a very simple. It's it's very early. Um, it's only been out a little while, but you just run BT Sync. You download the thing and run BT Sync, and then you point your web browser at localhost colon eight 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 eight, and then you get a little web user interface where you can share files. It's really nice. Brilliant. Cool. Excellent. Let's give it a go. <laughs> It's time for your feedback. Woo! Too, much, in, what? too much excitement there, <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thrilled that so many people have taken the time to give us so much wonderful it feedback. Is. Mm, there is a lot of feedback. Yeah, it's great. Uh, Nigel Verity wrote us a very long email. The main point of it seemed to be... I listen to a lot of Linux podcasts, and every week there's stuff about Canonical's plans for Ubuntu apparently driving a wedge between the company and the community. Regardless of whether these sorts of comments reflect reality or not, they could easily cloud people's views on which distro to use because linux are so passionate that might mean linux people linux users users are so passionate about their operating system they tend to keep themselves well informed on what's going on and what's being said if they were like most windows users and took little interest in their software as long as it works then radical innovations and changes in direction would be seen as far less controversial I think that if people spent less time worrying about what Mark Shuttleworth or John O'Bacon said and concentrated more on the question, does this software do what I want it to, then we might end up with more cooperation and less conflict. Well, 
Yeah, that's an interesting point of view, isn't it? Mm. Yes. I, I think it's good that there's, there's people out there keeping us in check and making sure we are doing the right thing. Um, but there is something to be said for just using the software. Mm. Yeah, I mean, no one would... If if Windows decided to change their window manager, people wouldn't say, oh, my God, I'm never using Windows again because I can't access the source code for the... Well, like, well I didn't might. write the window manager. Some might. Some might. And when, when Windows 8 came out, lots of people threw their toys out the pram. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, because they effectively changed the window manager. You know, it's... Yes. Um, I think I think every every um, platform has that kind of passionate set of people who you know are very uh, interested in the details. But I think with and we have more. Yes, of that's that's the point. It's, <laughs> it's it's most of us. Whereas with Windows, it's not most. Of Tiny them. proportion. And yes. Windows is the end experience. If the end experience doesn't change, nobody's going to notice. Mm. Well, yeah, but then. Having just switching to me and might not change the end experience, but that's still got people upset. <laughs> yes, I'm always in favour of paying less attention to Jono. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah, Jono. that's tricky sometimes. Yeah, um, he likes to make himself heard. That's true. <laughs> um, Dave Jeffrey uh, heard us read out his email on the last episode. Many thanks for the kind words. I've returned the favour and uploaded another bit of stupid rubbish, which includes some news of Alan's planned trip to Somerset. What's this? Uh, so sure. Dave, Je- Dave Jeffrey, if you remember last week, he called us up. Uh, he called us out for called me out for <laughs> being horrible about uh, video editors on Linux. Yeah. And, oh, and yeah. I said, yes, he's got an excellent uh, YouTube channel and he does lots of cool videos. Mm. And he's done another one about you. Well, no, it's 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 a long video. It's 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 worth watching. It's quite funny. Yeah. Uh, if you're if you're about my age or a little bit younger, then you might recognise some of the bits because uh, it's like a retro BBC kind of thing. No good for me. Then. No. It's, I have watched it, and it's very clever. If you look at the end, he's got cre- he credits which bits of software he uses yeah. to create all the graphics, and it's all the GIMP and Inkscape and Synfig like and stuff. Yeah, like that. cool. And uh, he even used the uh, photograph, the headshot photograph, yes. um, with without permission <laughs> <laughs> from the copyright holder, which would be me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put a link in the show notes. No, we won't. <laughs> Tootie left the following on the blog. Don't use QQ. It's made by Tencent. Anyone remember Tencent? Oh, no. No. They originally, back in the 80s, designed some really nasty computer viruses. Go ahead and use it at your peril. What's QQ? Uh, it was the... We were talking about um, Kylin, the Chinese Ubuntu derivative. And we talked about the fact that there are some localised things, applications that are using QQ as one of them as a messenger mm. system. Yes. Um apparently not a good idea if the, well, Chinese, if you, the Chinese government have got their hooks into it. But then stuff, if you want but... to speak to your relatives in China and yeah. that's what they're using, then mm. yeah. It's the same as the, you know, the Skype problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Dan Fish typed the following in his email client and sent it to us. <laughs> Very much enjoying the podcast, but I have a problem with the show length. An hour is a good length during the school term as that's about the same length as my commute to work. However, during the school holidays, when Tarquin and Harriet aren't being chauffeured the 500 metres to their school in Mummy's Chelsea tractor, the commute drops to 30 minutes. This poses a problem. I could listen to the second half on the commute home. However, having turned 40 five days ago, in the evenings I find it hard to remember what I had for lunch, let alone what I did in the morning. I'm not surprised people think you're the wing commander. <laughs> so, when, I, I read that in that. I don't, it seemed like the right voice to read it in. <laughs> when, I, when I first read this, I thought he meant his children were Tarquin and Harriet being chauffeured in the Chelsea tractor. And I thought, wow, would you really out yourself like that? <laughs> and I realized he was talking about everyone else. <laughs> well, well, hopefully um, Dan is pleased with the half hour episodes that we're putting out because he can fit one of them in his commute to work when the schools aren't in and then have two of them back to back when the schools are in. Yeah, maybe we, we should do some bonus episodes or uncut or maybe the, uh, you know, the bits you didn't see. I hate to point this out, but this is the uncut version. <laughs> we, don't, we don't cut it. Oh, yeah. I forgot don't. about that. And finally, John, the nice guy, so he says, Spriggs. He really is a nice guy. He is guy. a nice guy. <laughs> uh, wrote to tell us about the Open Sourcing Mental Illness Project. I've been following this project since Ed spoke on his PHP podcast, Development Hell, about his situation. I think it's a really important thing to be talking about. On the Indiegogo page, it says he's interested in talking to podcasters. Would you consider talking to him? Yes. Yes. Well, that was easy. Um, well, the good news is that um, it's a talk, basically, that uh, I think 
sorry, I can't remember his name. Dave, isn't it? Um, is looking to give Ed, sorry, Ed, 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 sorry. Ed um, is looking to give at uh, various conferences about mm. uh, raising awareness of uh, mental illnesses, depression, and things like that, um, and their prevalence in the open source community. Mm. And he was looking to raise three thousand dollars to help him get to some of these conferences and submit his talk. And he has raised five thousand four hundred and five dollars. Brilliant! So nearly double the amount he was asking That's brilliant. for. Maybe and we he, can get him to walk camp. And he did um, outline exactly how much you know he was after and what the money would be spent on and flights and all mm. that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was really. It's a, it's a really interesting subject um, because you know, there are a lot of people mm. in the open source community who seem to have um, you know, difficulties with mental illness from time to time. Yep. Um, if you've got any ideas for who you'd like us to interview on the show, get in touch with one of the many ways that are listed on our website and that you'll hear in a minute. Um, we can't promise anything, but we can try and get in touch with them and see if they want to come on the show and talk to us horrible lot. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If there's something you think we should talk about or someone we should talk to, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. That's all for this episode. So thank you very much indeed for listening. Um, you can join us live on Wednesday the twenty sorry Wednesday the eighth of May at nineteen thirty UTC. Uh, that's half past eight in the evening, twenty thirty BST for those of you in the UK. Um, when we'll have our next live episode, mm. who's going to mm. be here? Me. 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 Excellent. And How I'll about be you, Tony. I'll be here. Yeah. Oh, good. I'll be a whole people. year older by then. Ooh. Oh dear. Blimey, go and buy time travel fast for you, doesn't it? <laughs> Wibbly wobbly. <laughs> Tiny whiny. <laughs> She's not that old. <laughs> right, I've got to go and buy a card. I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>